And welcome to our latest uh, market update at 7 a.m. Thanks ever so much for taking the time to listen today. Uh, I should start off today's session by mentioning we did have a slight technical glitch on Friday, which means what we're actually doing today is running a, a dummy session, but covering exactly the same content as covered on our initial um, webcast dated the 29th of January. Um, as, a, as I mentioned, thanks ever so much for giving up the time to listen today. We do appreciate that this time of year is, of course, very, very busy. Uh, the reason we're hosting today's webinar uh, is really is no secret that the markets have been incredibly volatile. Uh, in turn, that's getting a lot of press attention, and clearly that's called for clients to react and ask a lot of questions. So we absolutely understand the need for you to be equipped with the answers as and when those questions come up, hence why we're spending some time with our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Derbyshire, today. The format will be that we will run for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, Chris will speak for 10 to 12 minutes on uh, exactly what we think is going on out there and what we're doing about it, uh, and frankly, uh, what you should be telling your clients. Um, and we'll then run through some questions that we received uh, on the live webinar itself. Um, any questions that you do have, um, obviously, it's not a live session, so we aren't able to take those. So please do send an email to your or call your relationship manager at 7am. We will make the utmost effort to come back to you with any answers to those questions. Um, in the meantime, um, I'll hand over to Chris Derbyshire, 7 IM's Chief Investment Officer. Uh, Chris. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, yes, I think the, the news is that markets are making the news. Um, markets more than economic data, perhaps I think even more than company earnings, although we're in earnings season, we're getting our, I think, usual supply of surprises and disappointments in terms of company earnings. But it's really the behavior of markets which has shocked everybody. Uh, and it's almost as if there's a run on markets, a run on investor confidence, rather like a run on a bank, when investors kind of worry about what the next investor might do and sell in advance of that. And of course, this selling forces prices down below fundamental levels. Um, a lot of causes are being offered by commentators and analysts to explain recent market behavior, and we'll take a look at a couple of those in a second. But I think anyone that tries to read too much into markets is really making a mistake. You know, markets don't know something uh, special. They, they, they are not um, possessed of special powers. They're not some kind of super investor like a Warren Buffett or something that knows something we don't. Um, in fact, if anything, markets are really an average. You know, it's the average of all the investors out there, the average of all their positions, and half of those positions will lose money um, over time. Um, so markets can't predict the future. We must be careful about reading too much into them. Does the world really change? You know, this fast markets up and down. You know, three percent a day is an unusual at the moment. Does does the global growth? prospects really change by 3% every day. And of course, everyone knows that that's, that's not the case. Does the oil price, which is a very volatile asset class, you know, goes up and down 15% a week at the moment, does that really tell us much about the, the, the wider world? And I would argue it doesn't. Um, so let's um, start off on the presentation and just take a look at interest rates. You know, this was the big concern uh, going into the end of last year, what would the Fed rate rise do? Would it, you know, would it hike? Would it not hike? Well, we've had the hike, and people aren't really referring so much to the Fed anymore. Um, I think since the start of the year, markets have really not been driven by that. Um, and, and here's a chart simply showing federal funds rates, or what we would call base rates, over the last 60 years or so. And you can see that um, we are you know, even if rates get up to about 3% by 2018, which is the Fed's own forecast, the market is significantly lower than that, that we're not really going to be in a particularly high interest rate environment. Um, in fact, if you look at the cost of servicing debt at the moment in the US, in the UK, it's actually at all time lows and, and very affordable. So I don't think that's an issue. So let's think about China for a second. So China, uh, China slowdown is something you hear a lot in the press. Um, and what I've done on this chart is I've got two 
you know, two data, data series here. The black line is Chinese GDP growth year on year, so the percent growth every year. Um, and you can see that Chinese growth has been slowing for actually about five years. So this is not new news. It happens uh, mainly because as the Chinese economy gets bigger, um, it's harder for the economy to continue to grow at the same growth rate. It's ends to, the growth rate tends towards the growth rate of the world as a whole. So you would expect some slowing of growth over time. Um, on the chart I've also got in the yellow bars, I've got here the actual amount of dollar growth. So this is the absolute level of growth being added every year by the Chinese economy. And you can see that these bars hover around about the one trillion dollar mark. Um, and really, we've got a, maybe a slight slowdown in 2015, um, some of that coming from the, the, the devaluation of the, of the Chinese currency, but not a huge amount there. So China still adding a very healthy amount of growth to the world every year. And, and, and um, of course, the other concern about China is the devaluation. So looking at that slide, um, what I wanted to highlight here is that the Chinese devaluation, which is all of 2.5% on a trade-weighted basis, so that's comparing the chi China's currency with an average of the currencies that China does business with. Um, compare, compare that to the 30% of appreciation we've had over the last five years. And you look at that chart and you really have to wonder, you know, what is all the fuss about? Um, the devaluation against the dollar has been slightly higher, 6% rather than 2.5%, but the dollar has been particularly strong over this period. And these numbers are not high by the standards of economies over the last few years. You know, we had um, much more substantial devaluations of the yen and the euro within the last few years. Um, doesn't look like the end of the world to me. Now, you could argue that China's currency depreciating is, is, is going to lead to China exporting deflation. Um, but I'm, you know, that, that uh, may be the case in some goods that ch where China is, you know, a large part of the value chain in producing that good. But I would argue that things that cost less for Western consumers, not necessarily a, a bad thing, actually. And the real pain here is felt by the Chinese exporters, which are largely state-owned enterprises, that if they sell products below cost price, they will lose money, and at some point they will have to be recapitalized by the owners, which are, is, of course, the state in China. Uh, and we see a bit of that going on with the Chinese government offering to help out with redundancy programs and so on. So again, even the idea of exporting deflation doesn't fill me full of horror as a Western consumer. It makes me feel a bit more maybe wealthy than I would have done otherwise. Um, which leads me on to Chinese demand. So quite often you get this narrative that the oil price is down because China's demand has fallen off a cliff. Um, and I just want to highlight that that's not the case on this chart. So here we have Chinese imports of crude oil in volume terms. So this is numbers of barrels rather than the usual terms you'll see this data in, which is US dollars spent on importing that oil. And, and looking at volumes, of course, the picture is actually quite healthy. You can see this trend is upwards on the chart. It's around about 10% at the moment. So in other words, Chinese imports of crude oil are up about 10% uh, or in 2015, we're up about 10% on the year before. And that's a very healthy level of growth indicates China's economy is doing quite well. Um, of course, if you were to look at this in dollar terms, you'd see a very different picture. And I think that's what the media have really picked up on, that in dollar terms, this number would be down about 40, 47% um, year on year. And what that simply means is that China is spending less money on energy than it did the before. It doesn't, there's nothing about China's demand for energy. In fact, it's a good thing that China can now finance its energy consumption uh, quite a lot more cheaply than it could previously. Um, 
That which brings me on to the global demand for oil, because there's another, you know, narrative out there which says that the oil price is going down because global demand is going down. There's some kind of slowdown or potentially a recession going on in the world. And it simply isn't the case. There's no evidence for this. If you look at, I mean, here's a chart showing oil production and oil consumption. The, the dark line on the chart is production, and the, 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 the orange, the, the kind of pale orange line is, consu is, is um, consumption. And if we just focus on consumption for a second, you can see that there is an upward trend on this chart. It's been in evidence for a couple of decades, and it continues on up. Um, in fact, in absolute terms, 2015 was a, was a humdinger of a year for global demand um, growth in, in volume terms. And the darker line on the chart is production. Of course, production has risen above consumption. And it doesn't look like much on the chart, but this is actually quite a significant difference. And it's that excess production, the excess supply of oil, which is mainly responsible for keeping the oil price down. Um, and by the way, um, natural gas is, is also a very large part of the world energy market. It's about 20% 20, 20 of global consumption of energy, and, and that's been down for a decade. Um, but no one saw that as, uh, as an indicator of a global slowdown. Uh, and the coal price, and coal is 30% is of global energy consumption, and that's been down for five years. But again, no one saw that decline in price as being an uh, indication of weak global demand. And on the following slide here, I just wanted to highlight that, of course, falling oil prices has some benefits. Um, this is a bit out of date. It's from July. But you can see that uh, back in July, the price of a gallon of regular petrol in the US had fallen from $3.50 to $2.68. Uh, it's by the way, currently $1.86, so about half of its price of, of, of 18 months ago now. Um, and it's not, of course, just, it's not just oil which is causing the benefits here. The warmer weather in the US and, and heating oil is a big, you know, big part of US energy usage. Together, that suggests that and export, ex experts are estimating that the average US family that heats primarily with heating oil will save about $760 this winter compared to last winter just on heating their house, quite apart from the benefits coming from the lower oil price. And if you heat your house with propane, which many Americans do, the saving is about $500. So what's happening here is that thanks to the decline in oil prices, a large amount of money is being put into the pockets of US consumers. And historically, that's not been a bad thing for economic growth. Of course, it's also good for most industries, particularly if you have to transport things around the country um, or around the globe. Um, all the more surprising, therefore, that the Dow Jones Transportation Index is down 3% more than the S&P 500 so far um, this year. But I think that tells you a lot about what markets are reading into oil price changes. They're not able to see past the kind of immediate short-term volatility here into the benefits on a slightly longer term view. Um, GDP, word on that, um, uh, it's being depressed by a reduction in capital expenditure in the oil industry. So we think this is the major uh, impact on GDP, and that's really why it's not running at the kind of 3% rate that forecasters expected it to at the beginning of last year. And on this chart, what we've got here are two measures of, uh, of output. One is GDP. You can see it's dropping down towards 2% per annum growth. And the other is something called domestic final sales, which the, um, was introduced in the US to eliminate sort of less, sort of more volatile elements of, of GDP. So for example, um, inventories and net exports and government spending are eliminated from the domestic final sales number. So you can get a kind of a better appreciation of what's, of what's kind of going on at the core of the economy. And that figure is kind of hovering around the 3% level. It doesn't look too bad. So there are measures, um, economic of data, which, you know, which the US economy doesn't look too bad. 
Um, people talk about deflation a lot. I think it uh, definitely seems to be one of the main causes given in markets for market volatility. Um, and I just want to highlight here that if you look at core inflation rather than in headline, so stripping out again the more volatile components of inflation such as energy and, and food um, prices, and you end up with a picture of inflation gently rising as it has been indeed over the last year. And that picture is the same whether you're looking at European inflation, you know, where uh, people really are seem to be concerned more about, about um, potential for, for deflation or disinflation, and also the same in the US. So core inflation looks OK, uh, no deflation argument there. Um, consumers, obviously pretty important. Consumers are the main growth engine for the global economy, and in particular the US consumer. What I wanted to highlight on this chart is two different measures of, of consumer health. Um, the light colored line on this chart is retail sales growth year on year, and that's just denominated in dollars. So you can see from the chart that that looks like it's pretty slow and that it had a bad year in 2015, dropping down to growth of about half a percent from previous levels of about 2%. Um, but actually, of course, when you denominate stuff in dollars and the dollar is very strong, you're going to get a collapse in retail sales. And part of that's coming from the oil price and people are spending a lot less on fuel, which is, I, I've argued is a good thing, not a bad thing. And part of it's coming from you know, purchases of audio, visual equipment, and other stuff manufactured in, in countries where the currency's gotten a lot weaker. So those, those goods are now cheaper. So what we've also got on this chart is um, a, a, a data series called Real Consumption, which is uh, consumption in the US after allowing for these dollar, uh, dollar effects. And you can see that this is a much more healthy looking picture. Um, and we've got a figure for consumption of around about 2.5-3% per annum growth. Uh, and then final slide, um, I just wanted to highlight again, how important is manufacturing? Because manufacturing is really where the weakness is uh, in the world at the moment. Um, and on this chart, we've got three lines. Uh, we've got um, a red line, which is the mining and logging industry. So this is capturing the, the oil business. And you can see a very slight decrease in jobs created by the oil industry over the last 18 months. Um, and then the line above that is a gray line. Um, and that is the jobs created in the manufacturing sector, which you can see is a very slight positive over the last 18 months. Uh, and then finally, the most important line on the chart is the blue line, and that's the jobs created in the US service sector over the last 18 months. And here you can see a very solid performance. About just over 3.5 million jobs have been created in the US service sector over the last 18 months. And it's really that that's the, the main uh, driver of, of growth. So manufacturing, not in recession, in the US, um, outside the mining uh, and the energy industry, but it's, it's, it's not growing very fast at the moment. Um, so what, where does this all, all leave us? Well, I mean, it seems that our portfolios have been in the eye of the hurricane recently. Everything we like seems to have been hit hardest, and, and short-term performance is poor. Um, but we also know that the market is, tends to be over-emotional. Uh, it can be. It is very volatile. It's certainly behaving very strangely at the moment, and has been for a, for quite a few months actually. Um, we don't really want to make a call on markets. We can try and anticipate market ups and downs. Um, we might get lucky. Um, we might not. And, and it's not something we can do with any great degree of certainty, particularly when markets are being as um, irrational and perverse, I would say, as they are at the moment. Um, so what we're doing is we're sticking to thinking about economies and earnings and where will those earnings come through, um, where will the dividends grow. And this is something that we can do and have done over a long period of time with, with some degree of certainty. What I really mean by this is that we're sticking to our investment process. Um, let's not try and predict what other investors will do. Let's, let's 
stick to our process and what we think markets will do. We continue to avoid uh, lower risk bonds in favor of equities. Um, equities have been very volatile. Uh, they will no doubt be more, more volatile than bonds. But at least with equities, you've got the chance to bounce back. And if the world isn't fundamentally broken, which we think is the case, then equities will bounce back at some point. We're concerned with, with bond holdings that actually there could be a more significant, perhaps even permanent um, impairment of capital there because it would take so, if, you know, if there is a hit to the bond market, it would take so long to get that money back with, with yields where they are that effectively it becomes a locked in. Loss. So we continue to avoid bonds, which means we're going to have more port we're going to have more volatility in our portfolios. Um, but we think it's the right thing to do. Uh, will produce the best results more consistently over the longer term. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, some really interesting stuff there, and I hope that's been useful for everybody to get a flavour of, of where our thoughts are uh, and what we're up to. Um, as promised, there were a, a couple of questions uh, that we'll run through, uh, one of which we actually got prior to, the, uh, to, to our initial session. Um, so Chris, I think it's fair to say that uh, the percentage drop in values for, for the more risky investor, i.e. moderately cautious, adventurous, so higher up the risk scale have been, uh, been fairly high and quite eye-watering in some cases. Um, from 7IM's point of view, um, was there any overexposure in any particular regional asset class? Uh, if so, what lessons uh, have been learned from that uh, and what will change in the future in order for people to maintain confidence in our investment process? Um, so, um, as I said, the things we like best have been hit hardest. And I think the, really the three markets um, that have hit performance hardest are our Asian equity positions, um, our Japanese and our European equity positions. And also what's happening, and this is quite important, is that they're all being hit at the same time. So that benefit that we normally have from diversification is not kicking in at all, actually. Um, and these three markets are really the, the, the three worst performers uh, when we have these sudden, sudden violent downturns. Um, I think we, I mean, our investment process is set up to handle bad decisions. You know, we make good and bad decisions all the time. Normally, um, a bad decision would, would be offset by other good decisions in the portfolio. And this, in fact, is what happens over a longer period of time. But in the short term, all three of these markets are being hit. Now, we like all three of these markets a great deal. Um, Asia's perhaps a little bit more risky than, than Europe and Japan, but it's also significantly cheaper and has that much more upside. Um, and we think with currencies having been um, uh, sort of devalued a bit over in Asia, then um, there should be earnings coming through there over time. Um, Europe and Japan, a bit more surprising to us why they got hit. You know, Japan doesn't really have an energy sector. Uh, in its stock market, it imports nearly all of its energy, particularly since the reactors have been shut down there. Um, and, and so we do sort of scratch our heads when we see Japan going up and down with the oil price. But I think it's, that's more about the kind of markets we're in and the fact that they completely ignore you know, the fundamentals. I think the same applies to Europe, where Europe's actually been a bit of a success story over the last year. You know, the economic environment has gotten much better the, the earnings are coming through a bit, um, valuations getting pretty reasonable there. So I think you know, we, we, that's why we're seeing the um, big declines when we see them. Uh, are we going to change? No, we don't think these declines are telling us anything about the value of our investments there. Um, we like, in fact, we're you know, slowly drip feeding money into the market to try and pick up better valuations than we've had really for for a, for a couple of years or so. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, another question we have, which is, is fairly uh, related, I guess, to the first one. Um, we talk a lot at 7 am and always have done about our robust risk process, having a team independent of your investment team uh, who stress test the portfolios and effectively make sure we're not taking more risk than we say we will. Uh, we agree that we uh, will stay within a, a, a corridor, if you like, for, for clients within a various risk profile. What, what, would, you, uh, what would your comments be on that? H have we taken too much risk? Um, I, well, I think we still have a very robust risk management process here. We have our 
parameters that we manage our funds within. And we're well within those parameters. So our funds are actually realizing um, volatility of the kind that we've indicated would be the long run norm for them. Um, we, were, we are moderately risk on, I would say. We're not massively risk on. Um, we're moderately, we were moderately risk on going into August. We've, as I said, drip fed um, uh, two or three percent more equity into the portfolios since then, but not not massive changes. Um, no, it's more the problem is that the correlation in markets um, uh, impacting some of our bigger holdings, all happening at the same time, all happening with a short space of time. You know, you you, you look at that and you think it was a uh, uh, running a high level of risk, but it's really um, uh, not from a, a volatility point of view. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and just one last question, uh, I think uh, in the interest of time we'll, we'll cover it quickly. Uh, clearly the, uh, today's, uh, today's session is really, uh, the, uh, and what, what, what we read in the press has really been about oil and, and, and a China slowdown, but something that's going to be coming down the, uh, down the tracks fairly soon I imagine, um, is, is the UK market and how it's going to affect, uh, sorry, be affected whilst there are still EU negotiations going on. So do you think we'll suffer leading up to that and uh, ultimately uh, how do you think we'll fare if there is a Brexit as it's being called? Um, I mean we, we, we do seem to be suffering. The pound is at 142 to the dollar. Very um, odd that really for this point in the cycle. And also the UK economy is doing just as well as the US economy. So I think we probably are suffering um, from fears. Um, and the fears are related to, as you say, what would happen if Brexit did, you know, did occur. And for me, it would be bad for the pound. You know, I think the pound relies on a lot of foreign direct investment. You know, we, the UK, is a stepping stone for Europe, really. So, you know, manufacturers and, and um, other companies around the world do often base their kind of uh, head offices or manufacturing facilities in the UK with a view to exporting to, to Europe. And I think that helps with our balance of payments, which helps keep the pound uh, relatively strong. So I think there is a problem there. Um, and I do think that uh, Brexit would be potentially quite damaging for, certainly for UK stock prices in the shorter term, um, possibly indeed for the economy on a you know short to medium term basis. Um, it's certainly not what I think is going to happen. Um, you know, you have to go to the betting websites to really get the best steer on what's likely to happen and it looks like from those websites that there's very little chances that Brexit will be voted on. But yeah, I think the, the fear is definitely there. Excellent. Well, uh, I think, I think uh, thanks very much, Chris. I think that's probably about enough from us. Um, thanks again for taking the time to listen. We really do appreciate your time is, uh, uh, your time is uh, very short. Um, but we're always keen to get, uh, uh, to, get, to get as much contact with you as we can. Um, of course, your, your relationship manager or business development manager will be on hand to answer any questions that uh, today's session might have thrown up, so please do get in touch for that. Uh, and finally, I should add, um, we are looking to roll these out a little bit more, but a bit more bulletin style as we've done today, uh, but also run some staple kind of um, subject webinars throughout the year. So any feedback that you'd like to give your relationship manager or, or, or PDM uh, on today's session, we'll, we'll gladly take and consider. Um, I think that's, uh, that's all, so that just leaves me to say thanks very much, uh, and thanks Chris for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks all.